Hi, um, my name is Kalia Firester. I'm a junior here at Hunter College High School. And today I'm going to share with you some of the things I've learned from my time researching parasites at the Volcani Agricultural Research Center. One of the first things I learned is that, as humans, we like to think of ourselves as the only organisms who can manipulate plants to best produce food for us. However, that is not the case. Not only are we not the only organisms to do this, we might not even be the best at it. This is a worm about one-tenth of a millimeter long. It's found on almost all continents, lives about three weeks, and its manipulation of our crops costs us $100 billion a year. It is called the plant parasitic nematode, and it is a microscopic parasite that we have no way of controlling, except for toxic fumigation. Nematodes hatch from eggs in the soil and infect the roots of plants. While living inside, they will force the plant to create specialized feeding grounds, they will develop and reproduce, and eventually, they'll kill the plant. During their stay, plant parasitic nematodes will engage in a complex chemical war against their host plants. Today, I'm going to talk about how understanding the tactics of this pest during this war can help us develop not only solutions, but environmentally friendly ones. A plant's parasitic nematode taking over a plant is like a squirrel taking over a building. As a predator, the nematode cannot physically overcome the plant or carry enough of any chemical to affect something so large. Instead, it releases small amounts of specialized proteins. These proteins interfere with the plant's natural functions. They induce specific genes, stop cellular communication, and block defensive reactions. In other words, the nematode relies on using the plant's own machinery to take it down. Plants are sedentary. They must rely on their chemical and cellular processes to scout the intruding nematodes and combat them. Plants fight, um, plants fight these pests by releasing their own toxins. They also cordon off their own cells when they are infected to prevent the spread of an infection and to prevent pests from developing. Nematodes rely on the plant's chemical processes from the very beginning of their infection. Born in the soil, the very first step in infecting a plant is finding it. As a creature without eyes or brain rooting around in dirt, it relies on the smell of chemicals and metabolites released from the plant, which are called exudates. Following the exudates will not only tell the nematode where the plant is, but can tell it what kind of plant it is and whether or not it has already been infected by other nematodes. In this way, nematodes can, nematodes can avoid overcrowding and competition for resources. Knowing how the pest identifies and finds the host presents the first, pre first opportunity for us to prevent infection. We can try to stop it before it begins, which we might be able to do by interfering with this chemical smell of the plant. To see if this would work, I grew plants in a substance that was mixed with metabolites taken from other plants. These metabolites, called oxylipins, have a very distinct smell, and when mixing with the natural smells of the plant, might confuse the nematodes and prevent them from locating it. We monitored the process of nematodes infecting the roots through this media and found them all clumped together, as shown in this picture. The clump is pretty easily explained. They hadn't moved since their original location where I dropped them with an eyedropper, which shows us that interfering with the chemical signals makes the nematode blind to their environment. They don't know where they want to go. They don't know where to begin their infection. Once the nematode locates the plant in a successful infection, it secretes a chemical that breaks down the hard cell wall and enters the root. Once it is inside, the nematode will travel to the vascular cylinder, which is the main water and nutrient pipeline of a plant. This is where it will begin to feed and develop. But rather than just feeding off of any surrounding tissue, the nematodes will induce special feeding sites. They'll secrete a protein into the plant that has a message, divide. But this is a modified message. These cells, in normal cellular division, which results in two identical cells, this message tells the plant cells Grow larger, double in organelles, double in nutrients, but wait, don't split. And this process will continue until there are giant cells dozens of times larger than normal ones, which are full of nutrients drained from the rest of the plant. These giant cells, shown in the middle, 
will eventually get so large, they'll affect the physical appearance of the root, as shown here. The parasites will then feed on these giant cells, getting large and laying their eggs on the outside of the plants. This process raises a lot of questions about the plant defense system. Mostly, where did it go? Why is the plant not responding to a parasite breaking, entering, and manipulating the cells that will eventually kill it? As a parasite, the nematode has co seemingly contradictory goals. On one hand, it has to keep the plant healthy enough to survive. Yet on the other, it has to feed on this plant long enough to reproduce. The growth of the nematode within the plant depends on the plant not being aware of the parasite living inside of it. However, since, as we discussed, the nematode is manipulating the essential components of a healthy plant, it must also manipulate the plant's defense system to not target itself or its feeding ground. There are two main strategies of a plant under attack. The first is called the hypersensitivity response. The second is the release of toxins. First, I'm going to talk a bit about the hypersensitivity response. This response occurs when a plant will kill off its own sick or infected cells to prevent the spread of an infection or to prevent a pest from developing. As you can imagine, this would be the right response to an enormous mutated cell feeding a family of parasites. However, this hypersensitivity response is not occurring. Since the parasites are dependent on the survival of their feeding grounds, they have found a way to circumvent the plant's natural reflex to destroy the giant cells. Nematodes have, been, have evolved to be able to induce a specific gene in the plant called the alpha-dox-1 gene. The role of this gene in the plant is the exact opposite of the hypersensitivity response. Its job is to protect cells under stress. By inducing this gene, the nematodes force the plant to nurture the giant cell rather than kill it off. In order to see if this gene was activated by the parasite, we created a strain of plants without alpha-dox-1. We saw a sharp decline in nematodes developing to the mature adult stage to lay eggs, indicating that this gene is essential in their life cycle. This picture here is pretty interesting. We have our nematodes in pink, and then we have this blue color, which is a visualization of the alpha-dox-1 gene, which shows us visually that this gene is being induced by the nematodes. So, inducing the alpha-dox-1 gene and thwarting the hypersensitivity response only shuts down one of the two defense mechanisms we mentioned before. The plant should still be able to release toxins to kill the nematode. As you probably noticed this tree diagram here, it shows various plant defenses. There are still a lot of branches or options that the plant should pursue. Most of these are toxins that kill infecting organisms. For example, these are toxins that the plant can release to target nematodes. However, we have found that none of these toxins are being released upon infection. One thing that all the shutdown defenses have in common is that they are all controlled by a pathway called LOX, or lipoxygenase. This pathway is turned on and off by a substance called a free fatty acid. This fatty acid works like a light switch to tell the plant when it needs to synthesize toxins. When the nematode is inside the plant, the light should be on, indicating an intrusion. However, it's not. I recently participated in a study in which a protein was discovered in a plant's parasitic nematode, which might be responsible for controlling this essential switch. Nematodes secrete a protein called a fatty acid and retinol binding protein, or FAR. As you might have guessed from the name, FARs bind to fatty acids and retinol which are chemicals you might recognize from the facial cream section of your drugstore. However, for plants and nematodes, fatty acids and retinol are important for synthesizing necessary proteins and are used by plants as messengers between different chemical processes, including the on or off switch for these plant defenses. Nematodes might have evolved FARs to sequester the plant's fatty acids and break the signal that tells the plant to produce toxins. In one move, these worms have clipped off the entirety of plant defenses, preventing the plant from responding to their infection. To see if this was true, we created a strain of plants that prevented FAR from functioning, and we found that nematodes did not develop successfully, showing that when the plant became aware of the infection, it probably began to fight it. Finding a protein that has such a key role in infection 
presents a new way that we can target the nematode infection. By preventing FARA from functioning, we can rehabilitate plant defenses, and we can teach plants to fight off the enemies with their own defenses. The main reason plants are susceptible to nematode attacks is their inability to respond to it. However, if the plant responds, it might be strong enough to fight off the pest itself. Today I have mentioned several ways we can help the plant recognize and attack its invaders. Preventing the parasite, induction of specific genes, rehabilitating plant communication, even preventing the initial infection. These possible new control strategies are significant for two main reasons. We can avoid the use of external pesticides and fumigants, and this is genetic manipulation that does not involve foreign DNA. All the genetic material comes from the host plant, and we can avoid any dangers, scares, or unknown consequences of bringing in DNA from a different organism. Even more generally, studying plant parasitic nematodes has showed me we are not the best at manipulating organisms. Evolving alongside us from the beginning have been parasites who have had millions of years to hone their skills. By studying nature's methods, we can develop new ways to combat not only plant parasitic infection, but human parasitic infection and helping other organisms. Thank you. <laughs>